Scotland. Uh, I was missing the bagpipes a little there with Amazing Grace. I probably wasn't the only one that was kind of hearing them in the background. Uh, just kind of goes together for some reason. But um, I'd like to share a few thoughts about the communion. Uh, last week was Easter. And so, uh, you know, all around the world, actually, people were aware of this idea that uh, Jesus rose from the dead. And whether they believe it or not, they heard a message. That in fact, something amazing has happened. Uh, it's interesting because uh, a lot of times on the, on the Easter sermons, uh, it sort of becomes Easter CSI. It's uh, crime scene investigation. And uh, you know, the big thing is the tomb was empty. And so you have to kind of search around for evidence to kind of find out, so what really happened? And who are the players? And uh, some of you may watch these shows, but the whole idea is there's this puzzle, and someone's got to figure out sort of the sequence of events. And then uh, the real question is, what was the motive? What, why did this happen? Why do we see what we see? Mm. And whereas most often people think about the empty tomb and, of course, the trial of Jesus, and they think of all the things that led up to it, I'd like to think, us to think a little bit, uh, just, just a little bit on this phrase, Jesus, the Son of God, rose from the dead. I don't think for any of us here that's a shocking statement. But I'd like us just to sort of think about it and examine the assumptions. Jesus... The Son of God rose from the dead. What do we have to assume in that? Well, the first thing, to rise from the dead, Jesus, the Son of God, had to die. That's a pretty, you know, amazing thought. That Jesus, the Son of God, had to die. But for Jesus, the Son of God, to die, He had to first become mortal. Remember, this is the Son of God we're talking about. But then, then again, let's, let's go back another step. For the Son of God to become mortal, He would have to give up His place in heaven. I mean, the, I don't know, the, the plot for me is getting kind of thick right here. Because what, what's really going on? But, you know, for the Son of God to give up His place in heaven, the only... The final sort of thought I can think of is there had to be a reason. What is the reason? And I just want to sort of then reconstruct the story. Let's go over to Romans chapter 3. What is the reason behind God's plan? And there's a number of scriptures that just make it very clear that even before the creation of this world, as we can see it and we know it, God planned to send His Son, send His son as a sacrifice for our sins. Before the foundations of the earth, this was God's plan. But why? Look in Romans 3, we'll pick this up in verse 21. It says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time so be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, if I was just to uh, dissect this down completely, Scott wouldn't have any time to speak today at all. Uh, but the thing I just want to simply point out here, verse 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we go back to the beginning of human history, it began pretty nicely. God created the Garden of Eden. Everything was moving pretty smoothly. But then man and woman sinned. And this sin, this is what's important for us to understand. God said to them, the day you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. But that wasn't a lightning bolt from heaven. They died because when they heard God coming later that day in the garden, 
They went and hid. They judged themselves unworthy to come into the presence of God. Their sin and shame separated them from God. God didn't do it. It wasn't even, interestingly, a judgment of God at this moment. They judged themselves unworthy to present themselves before God. They judged themselves unrighteous. And I think the point you'll see is God actually agrees. God agrees with this self-judgment that sin separates and sin destroys. In fact, sin kills. So, ever since then, God's been in a, on a plan. And you might think, well, God could have just ended it right there. Uh, you know, I think it's the greatest act of mercy that when God didn't find them immediately there where they used to meet, however that worked, uh, and they were hiding in the bushes, God could have just said, well, that's it. I'll go to another planet and I'll start this over again. Uh, but God actually yelled out and called them out. And see, in a sense, God has been calling us out ever since, hasn't He? Mm -hmm. He's been inviting us out into His presence, but we need to understand what that costs Him. So the reason behind God's plan is our sin. The reason that the good news of Easter, Jesus rose from the dead, we go back the chain. Why did Jesus give up heaven? It was because of us. Because we needed somehow to be clothed in His righteousness so that we could be acceptable to God. Look over in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 fills in a few more gaps of just how this happens. We'll pick this up in verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. You know, it's interesting, we're about to celebrate communion, and the communion has two elements. There's bread, which represents the body of Christ, and then there's the fruit of the vine, which represents His blood. But what this says here is, Jesus gave up equality with God, and basically emptied Himself and took human form. He came into a body. I mean, it's pretty amazing just to give up heaven. And I think one of the reasons that there's a bread and a cup is that we can actually see, in some ways, the two-stage sacrifice of Jesus. This is the stage He gave up divine rights. He was God. He was there with God, had the glory of God, in a, in a way I think we can't even completely understand, was completely unified with God. But He gave that up for us. Could you even, can you relate to giving up divinity? Have you ever given up anything even close? You know, I gave up living in Canada once to move to Papua New Guinea. And uh, I felt like I gave up a little bit in making that shift. You know, it was 32 years ago. But the truth is, that's nothing. That's nothing. I, I would, I'd say it'd be like comparing giving up human life to become an ant. But even that doesn't show the gap of giving up divinity to become human. Well, look a little further, he says here. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, we see in Jesus becoming flesh, the giving up of divine right. But once that he's in the flesh, if there's one thing a human being deserves, it's a fair trial. It's how you would want to be treated. I mean, I think unfairness is the most heart-wrenching thing in this world, isn't it? And you want, you want to be treated with respect, especially if you're telling the truth. And Jesus was put to death because they claimed He lied. He blasphemed. And you know what His lie was? You claim to be the Son of God. Man. I mean, there's people who have accused me of lying before in, in my life. And the sad thing is, they've been right. And sometimes I've been deceived and sometimes I've just given in. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty. But Jesus was completely innocent 
And we see him not opening his mouth in any way. And so Jesus didn't just simply give up divinity. He gave up his human rights completely. On the cross, you see a man with nothing. No one came to his defense. Everything he owned had been stripped from him. And his future and his life were taken away. And did he complain? Did he mumble? Did he say, this isn't fair? No, he looked around and he said, forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus sacrificed heaven and then he sacrificed life here on earth. What do you think the cross is trying to get us to see? To forgive is sacrifice. When you forgive someone, you give up your right to retribution or to compensation. If you forgive someone, you say it's just as like it didn't happen. Now, it's not that it didn't happen. You can't make it not happen. But you can show acceptance as if it didn't happen. And see, on the cross, what we see in, in, in Jesus is the sacrifice of God. That God is willing to look at us and say, your sin put me here. The paradox of the cross, the Jews used the law of, G of God. They actually used the Old Testament to put Jesus to death. So the very moral guide that was actually supposed to lead them to Christ, they, they used to put Jesus on the cross. I just want us to close with Acts 2.22. Acts 2.22. Peter, in this first sermon, really, this is the first public preaching of the gospel after Jesus rose from the dead. He says this in verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death. You know, it says there, you, with the help of wicked men. That's just a clause. You put him to death. You did. By nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You know, this is Old Testament sacrifice language. In the Old Testament, often an animal would be sacrificed for the sake of a person. And the blood would be spilt and atonement would be granted. But the innocent died for that forgiveness. Jesus, all of that was just a shadow. Jesus is the real deal. Jesus died so that we could be forgiven. God gave up His claim to punish us through the cross. He demonstrated. And the cross needs to say something to us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, God loves us amazingly. But see, there's only one way to accept the cross. If an animal was being sacrificed in the Old Testament, the offerer put his hand on it, laid hands on the head of the animal, and associated himself and took responsibility for the death. What we are doing today in taking communion is simply a memorial, but it's a reminder. We're not enacting something again in, in like real drama. We are remembering the one time, the one and only sacrifice for our sins that needed only to be done once through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. So as we break the bread, let's think about the, the Son of God giving up all His divine rights. And then as we drink the cup after that, let's think about He gave up His life. You know, it's tough to relate to the divine one, but the human one we know well, don't we? And He has asked us to show our gratefulness by living in a like manner. So let's examine ourselves as we examine Christ. Let's pray together.